I really wanted to um, thank everyone for taking the time to be here today. Um, I know it's an hour and a half out of your schedule. I know we're all busy, but this is such a important topic to me. It's near and dear to my heart. Um, and it is a large concern for our local community and neighborhoods. Um, if you've been following the news this week in Columbus, um, attorney Zach Klein came out and said that our domestic violence homicides in Columbus have actually gone up threefold since this time last year. Um, and our own mayor, Mayor Ginther, has actually put out a press conference yesterday of um, putting out millions of dollars to support some additional um, domestic violence interventions in our city to help our local families thrive. Um, so intimate partner violence is the number one killer of pregnant women in the United States. Um, women who are pregnant or had just given birth in the United States are actually more likely to die by homicide um, than by any of the three leading obstetric causes. Um, this is why this conversation is so, so very important. And again, I want to thank everyone for being here today. Um, we at Celebrate One want to ensure that all of our families get the support and resources they need to thrive. Um, so we are able to partner with Ohio um, Domestic Violence Network, the Center for Family Safety and Healing, as well as the Ohio Secretary of State to put on this webinar. Um, I'm joined today with um, some of our amazing panelists. We have Emily Kulo, um, Julie Sespico, and Brian Malakowski. Um, they will be on today. We'll share a general overview of intimate partner violence. They will talk about some of the barriers that survivors um, hit when they are trying to get care. They'll talk about what intimate partner violence and domestic violence looks like during pregnancy and the perinatal period, um, as well as some awesome local and statewide resources that can help survivors stay safe and really get the help that they need. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. And with that, um, I want to invite Miss Emily Kulo. She's the Director of Mobile Advocacy and Meaningful Access at Ohio Domestic Violence Network, and she will start us off. Okay, so thank you so much. Um, my name is Emily Kulo. I am the Director of Mobile Advocacy and Meaningful Access at the Ohio Domestic Violence Network. I um have been working in the field of domestic violence for about 17 years and um a little bit just very briefly about what the ohio domestic violence network is we are the statewide coalition of domestic violence programs in ohio and we have a lot of different services um but one of the more specific services that we'll be talking about today is our health access project which focuses on connecting survivors of intimate partner violence domestic violence and other gender-based violence with um, more quickly accessing health care resources and really connecting those dots between the impacts of domestic violence on an individual's health and specifically that of um, women and pregnant people. So we have 76 member agencies across the state of Ohio. We provide non-residential and residential services to survivors of intimate partner violence, human trafficking, sexual assault, and stalking. And among those, as um, I'm going to mention, a lot of those survivors are coming in with um, obstetric needs. And so really focusing on the high lethality that can impact those individuals. So survivors of domestic violence have huge, that domestic violence has huge impacts on a survivor's health. Uh, we see survivors coming into domestic violence programming with higher incidence of chronic pain and chronic conditions. We see higher rates of seizures and strokes, both due to the um, complex trauma and stress that a survivor is under when experiencing domestic violence, but also as a physical result of the domestic violence itself. So um, when survivors are repeatedly hit in the head, choked and strangled, they're at higher rates of seizures and strokes. And so that's something that we see. We also see higher rates of incidents of mental health conditions, suicidal thoughts, um, likely brain injury, 
But um, more specifically, what we see is a lack of access for survivors to reproductive health care. So survivors come into our domestic violence agencies without having had much uh, OBGYN care um, throughout their relationship. And specifically, when a survivor is pregnant, we see that oftentimes survivors are coming into our programs without ever having had any sort of prenatal care or if they have just recently given birth any perinatal follow-up care. Um, this is often due to the domestic violence that they are experiencing. Um, we'll talk in a minute more about kind of what those barriers are and what an abusive partner will do to um, stop somebody from accessing care. We also see higher rates of unplanned and unwanted pregnancy. Often there is control around whether a survivor um, can be on birth control. And um, as such, then we see higher rates of miscarriage. Um, once a survivor does give birth, we see low infant birth weight. And we see increased um, uh, negative impacts on health for that infant. So what we know about domestic violence and specifically the, um, the power and control of an abusive partner is that in, an, in a domestic violence relationship, the abusive partner's primary goal is to maintain power and control over another individual. And it is that overt power and control that we see in domestic violence and especially within high lethality cases. Um, so when somebody becomes pregnant, when they are in a domestic violence relationship, we see that that power and control can shift. So abusive partners will suddenly become much more worried about losing control because as we know, if those of us are on the call today have, you know, experienced individuals having, um, giving birth, having children, those of us who potentially have had children, we know that that dynamic shifts in, in any sort of relationship, right? My relationship with my partner changed when I had children, um, our dynamic changed who maintained power and control changed. And in healthy relationships, that that ebb and flow of power and control and who and you know who kind of leads that conversation is normal. The, the normal ebb and flow of a domestic violence relation or of a non-domestic violence relationship is normal. Um, in domestic violence relationships, that is not the case. So there is that overt power and control. And when there's a child involved or a pregnant person involved, suddenly that power dynamic can shift, right? More focus is brought to the um, fetus and then the, the infant once they are born. And as such, um, abusers can really feel like they are uh, losing control. And so we see an increase in violence when individuals become pregnant in domestic violence relationships, even if it was potentially the abuser's idea or um, plan to get that person pregnant, because we do see that unplanned pregnancies increase as a result of trying to maintain that control. Um, but then once that person becomes pregnant, the violence will still increase oftentimes. So we see things centered around reproductive health and domestic violence like birth control sabotage, um, high incidence of sexual assault and rape, forced abortions when somebody becomes pregnant, increased physical violence during pregnancy, including abuse centered around the abdomen. Um, I will, this is graphic, but I think it's also very important to share. Um, we will see higher rates of survivors reporting that um, they have been like pushed down the stairs once they become pregnant. Uh, lack of access, as I mentioned, to the peri and postnatal health care, especially also when we talk about um, the mental health of the survivor who has just given birth. Um, so that's also something that is correlated to the physical health of the pregnant person and the, the infant or fetus. Um, and then we will also see higher rates of strangulation and partner inflicted brain injury when they're pregnant. And again, that is very um, detrimental to the health and safety of both the pregnant person and the fetus. So again, when we are seeing um, 
individuals come into our emergency rooms and coming into our doctor's offices and um, giving birth and ha having situations where you're seeing low birth weight and you're seeing a lack of um, prenatal care, um, questions around what's going on are going to be helpful as we try to um, figure out what's going on and try to maintain safety and health for those individuals. We also will see that it's connected to substance use coercion, right? So substance use coercion is a huge element of domestic violence. Oftentimes survivors who are using substances are started using as a result of the domestic violence, either because they were self-medicating or their abuser actually um, forced them into that activity. And so that again is going to impact the pregnancy and birth of that that child. So things that we can do, because I really hope that as we talk through some of this, and we'll get into more specifics with the other presenters um, here in just a moment about kind of what um, what's the real experiences of survivors and and all of that kind of thing but what can we specifically do as collaborative partners around this topic and one thing is around cross training on domestic violence and gender based violence um we really want and at ODVN and I'll talk in a minute about our health access project but at ODVN we really hope to engage um, all specialty care for survivors, but specifically OBGYN and reproductive health care um, agencies and communities to be able to address what's happening before it's too late, right? So, you know, with the mission, with the mission of Celebrate One, we want to get as many healthy babies to that one year mark. And so it really can start with better screening and referrals when a survivor is presenting in a um, gynecologist office, an OB office, or in an ER department as well, um, or a hospital setting when they're getting ready to give birth. And so being able to screen for DV, sexual assault, human trafficking is also something that is very co-related to this conversation. While we're in Domestic Violence Awareness Month, um, a lot of our focus is on DV, but human trafficking is also very correlated. And so um, paying attention to some of that is something that's very important too. Um, working with our collaborative partners and our community partners on not only screening for domestic violence in um, pregnant people, but then what to do and where to refer once that violence has been identified or disclosed. Um, something else that I know that is sometimes out of our control when we talk about how do we respond is it really encouraging longer appointment times at doctor's offices. As we all know, if we've experienced um, accessing healthcare, oftentimes doctors are required to have 15 minutes or less in, in a patient room. Um, when we talk about domestic violence and screening for domestic violence and other gender-based violence, this can be very detrimental to um, how much connection you can build with survivors to be able to even find out what's going in there and going on in their relationships. Um, again, also separating um, partners when you are in an OBGYN office and making sure that you're sitting down with potential survivors individually and not having their partner there. That's another big element of um, trying to figure, figure out what's going on and creating a safe space to do so. Um, one thing that I think is really important to talk about when we um, discuss this topic is what are survivors telling us that they need when it comes to um, accessing healthcare, when it comes to accessing the different systems that we're all navigating with them. Um, and connecting them to advocacy services is something that is very important. We completed the 2021 needs assessment and survivors of domestic violence and intimate partner violence are telling us um, over 600 survivors responded to our needs assessment and told us that when they have earlier connection to advocacy services, um, especially advocacy services like you're going to hear Julie talk about here in just a moment, um, if they have when they have advocates that can go with them to medical appointments and things like that, it can be very helpful in success 
best navigating through these different systems that are designed potentially to protect them, right? Um, and so if they have an advocate that's able to help kind of explain what's going on, um, it helps these different systems like doctors, like healthcare settings to believe what's, what a survivor is telling them is going on and um, increase success. At the Ohio Domestic Violence Network, we have a health access project that I mentioned, and we actually in Franklin County have a very um, wonderful opportunity to actually bring healthcare services to survivors. So we are working on building an infra infrastructure that allows domestic violence agencies to better connect with health resources for survivors, including OBGYN care, um, working with hospitals to um, create better bilateral referral, po referral processes for survivors. Survivors often don't have um, the ability to make those appointments on their, on their own. And so creating that advocacy that can help connect those dots um, and also creating bilateral training for our different healthcare resources in Franklin County and then um, with the domestic violence agencies. Uh, one really exciting opportunity that we have is to actually provide financial assistance for survivors to pay for medical related costs. Um, so if you are working with survivors and they are dealing with a lot of barriers like inability to um, not wanting to even connect with healthcare resources because of their inability to pay. We don't want that to be something that is impacting survivors. And so referring them to us um, to be able to help navigate that is something that can be very helpful. We want them connected with the DV agency first and foremost. So that's where we would start. Um, but it is an opportunity that we would have to be able to um, provide that connection for survivors and that assistance. Um, some resources up here, um, the Buckeye Region Against Violence Organization, Bravo, is the um, Franklin County partner that we have to provide that mobile advocacy that I mentioned on the last slide. Um, also in Columbus, you'll hear more about the Center for Family Safety and Healing and Choices, which can be great referrals. Uh, but if you would like just more information on ODBN and our different services and what we do, um, you can either visit odbn.org or you can scan this QR code that you see hopefully on the screen and that'll connect you with resources. Um, so any questions specifically for me and ODBN, um, Julie will get into more specifics around kind of those that you know, what we're seeing when we talk about, um, you know, health, the health of pregnant people and uh, fetuses. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat um, and Emily will be able to get you an answer. There will also be a time at the end to ask additional questions if you would like to hold off. Um, so those are the two options. And Michelle asked if you could put the QR code back up really quickly. Yeah, bear with me just for a second here. All right. Um, so as that is up, I'm going to introduce our next presenter. It does not look like there are any additional questions at this time. Thank you so much, Emily, for making the time to be here and for sharing um, what survivors go through to get access to care and some things we can do to help support them. Um, Julie Cespico is the training coordinator at the Center um, for family safety and healing. So that's something that Emily talked about today. Um, Julie will be sharing some information about intimate partner violence and how it relates and impacts to pregnancy, as well as some awesome resources. Um, so go ahead and take us away, Julie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agata. <clears throat> and thank you, Emily, for that um, wonderful overview and introduction to this topic. Um, there are, I'm going to, be moving through some of my slides more quickly because Emily um, did a great job covering a few of these points already. Um, and I also just dropped in the chat that a couple handouts that or links um, that maybe Agata you could recopy and repaste um, 
like as we get to those points, but just future uh, or just additional information for folks. Um, I will also make sure the slides are shared with you and they have the links in there as well with more information. So I'm with the Center for Family Safety and Healing. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about our center toward the end of, of my part of this conversation because I wanted to be able to continue forward with um, what Emily had shared really focusing in on the impact of intimate partner violence and the intersection with um, the maternal health care and infant health care as well. So uh, I heard Emily emphasize this and I just wanted to re-uplift that intimate partner violence is the leading cause of death for pregnant women in the U.S. I put in the chat an article that um, details this study that was done um, if you could drop that again, Agata, that's that NCBI um, link, if anyone's interested in reading more about that. But I just think it's really, really important to uplift this. Um, thinking about the ways that our, our state and other um, states around us have really responded so, um, so strongly to this need for infant uh, mortality task force reviews and infant mortality and infant health work. And then we are just kind of now getting up and running with the maternal side of that. And I know the state of Ohio has some initiatives that I've gotten to be a part of as well, but really thinking about the differences in the ways we approach children and, and infants health versus um, adult uh, especially adult parents who are who may be pregnant, we have sometimes a little bit less um, focus on on the maternal health. So really emphasizing what's best for the mom, the survivor is going to be what's best for the child. Emily really overviewed, but I'll just mention these kind of three pivotal, these three foundational things that make pregnancy really important, um, a really important time when we think about intimate partner violence that we see the impacts of intimate partner violence on health, which we'll talk a little bit more about. We see that abuse often increases during pregnancy, as Emily mentioned, due to the partner's perceived loss of control. So the one thing that they can't fully own or have total control over. And that abuse during pregnancy is associated with a significantly higher risk of lethality. Uh, Emily mentioned this reproductive coercion. So really focusing in on thinking about when we've got this, these coercive dynamics in, in, in a relationship. You think about some of the, the families that you've worked with, some of the moms that you might be thinking of right now, and how every aspect of their life, like we have to tiptoe around to avoid the partner's consequences, avoid their anger, avoid their um you know, their their temper or their rules. And so if every single thing we're tiptoeing around to avoid that negative response, then how does somebody navigate reproductive, you know, reproductive health? How does someone navigate birth control usage or family planning? Um, one uh, nurse that I was working with, she's a labor and delivery nurse, and she said, oh, I have this, um, I had this young mom, she was like 19 years old, she came in um, for delivery, and we were talking, talking, talking about how she said, this is going to be a, like my one child, and then I'm going back to school, so I'm getting a lark, I'm getting an IUD placed right after, after birth to be able to continue with my goals and dreams before I, I have um, any more children. So they had great conversations about that, they were able to place an IUD. And then a few weeks later, she came back in to have it removed. And she said, my boyfriend doesn't believe in contraception. So thinking about when that survivor's goals and dreams are butting up against that, that need for control, um, that's where we see this reproductive coercion come into play. So we may see more rapid repeat pregnancies, which we know the goals of safe spacing, can come right up against that need for, you know, that this these rapid repeat pregnancies because of this lack of consent, lack of ability to negotiate with that controlling person. Just a couple of really quick um, quotes I wanted to bring into the space. This is from the National Domestic Violence Hotline. They report uh, about one in four callers 
reporting domestic violence have experienced reproductive coercion, birth control sabotage, um, and pregnancy coercion. So things like, I better be pregnant or I'm in trouble with him. He refuses to use a condom. I've bought them and he throws them out. He has tried to talk me into having a child. He told me he wanted to keep me from leaving him. He admitted to me and the psychologist that he initially got me pregnant to trap me, or intentionally, excuse me. My sister was 14 years old when she became involved with this abusive guy. And when she was 15, his mother wanted grandkids, so he coerced her into getting pregnant. So we see that family violence component too. So holding all of this in mind, you think about your clients that you may be working with or families that you're working with where you see, oh, we've been working on safe spacing and they're, you know, right away having another child. Um, consider what may be at play that we're not witnessing. My dog barks at the moon siren. So sorry. <laughs> you can hear her little howl in the background. <clears throat> I'm going to skip through because Emily did mention the brain injury, the risk of brain injury with domestic violence. Okay, the siren should be quieter now. Can you hear that? Okay. Can you hear that? Yeah. Okay, so considering. Considering the ways a controlling relationship can impact. Maternal and infant health goals. This comes from Futures Without Violence, who've done a ton of work on addressing um, how we can better improve maternal health through things like um, home visitation programs, better OBGYN responses and care. So some of the things, if you think about for Celebrate One or others, I'm so sorry. I'm gonna take a one second pause and put her downstairs, one second. So as Julie is stepping out, um, I have noted some of you guys have put questions in the chat. Um, I did want to let you know that I am keeping track of all of the questions. So if anything comes up, feel free to drop it in there. And then at the end, we will circle back and answer all of those questions. So Julie, it actually worked out. I dropped my little spiel, so not a problem. Thank you so much. Apologies for my little dog who thinks she's a husky and likes to sing with that siren. Okay, so thinking about at, for folks who are with Celebrate One or other kind of home visitation kind of roles, uh, I know we have community health workers in the room, um, as well as other uh, case workers, folks who go out into the homes. Here are some of the things that you might be thinking about with your clients. You have goals around breastfeeding, right? We'll consider when there's intimate partner violence occurring, is that partner allowing their partner to breastfeed? Are they supporting their partner's breastfeeding? Um, thinking about substance use, we know that um, there can be sometimes coerced substance use and how that bumps up against your goals with maternal and infant care. Having missed appointments, like, can we talk about, you know, tell me about how using the car works for you as a couple. Um, are you able to access bus fare when you need it? How does banking or money work for you as a couple? Is it something you have access to? Um, thinking about pregnancy decisions, is this something that you can decide together or is this something your partner decides? Um, food is something that can be really complicated in homes, you know, especially on a tight budget or feeding lots of people. Are you able to get enough to eat? Is this something your partner is supportive of? And then asking about specific health and parenting strategies and touching base on if and how their relationship might be impacting either positively or negatively those goals. So I added in this slide really quickly that um, we have to also think about the impact on children of intimate partner violence. Um, before, you know, we, we of course think about children, um, you know, witnessing uh, domestic violence, you know, potentially physical violence or physical assaults or, you know, hearing, overhearing things like a partner constantly being put down, um, hearing their, their mother degraded or their parent degraded. But we also have to consider some of the intentional ways that a person using controlling behaviors can use children to kind of um, further control or further abuse the partner. So we see things like leaving children in unsupervised or unsafe situations, 
maybe driving dangerously with the children in the car, undercutting the other parent's rules, attacking the other person's parenting, pitting family members against each other, disrupting daily routines, um, disrupting nap schedules is something we hear about, this like intentional um, loading them up with sugar before they send them back to moms after, you know, their visitation day, um, disrupting like, you know, leaving their, um, always sending them home with dirty diapers or, you know, just not following the nap schedule or the feeding schedule. As this way, you know, we separate out when we're talking about coercive behaviors, we can separate out these um, these behaviors that any parent might have forgetful moments or get off schedule, right? Like that's understandable. But when we start to see these patterns of disrupting nap schedules all the time, sending the kids back to, to the other parent with like loaded with sugar or with dirty diapers and, um, or, you know, missing drop offs or just disrupting that routine or undermining parenting. That's where we see that those patterns of, of coercive control and then interfering with children, getting the physical or emotional health support that they need. Um, thinking about this impact on children, what we often see in a traditional response is mothers who may be victims of domestic violence, who are experiencing domestic violence survivors, that they are often the ones that are um, reported to children's services for failure to uh, pr protect their child. And we're really trying to move away from that framing because it really doesn't put the onus on the person who is engaging in the harmful behavior or who is causing the turmoil in the home. So Safe and Together Institute is an excellent resource. And this is that other link I had dropped in there, Agata, if you wouldn't mind re-putting re that in there. Excellent resource that really helps us think through who is really causing this behavior? How do I address, um, how do I find out about the protective factors that mom is using or that this parent who is a survivor is using to protect the children or protect her infant? Um, so really focusing in on the behavior of the person engaging in those abusive behaviors who is creating the risk and safety concerns for the child. And then this really ties into this research that Futures Without Violence has done asking, um, asking that this was a qualitative study that they did with uh, home visited moms and just wanted to share some of the findings here. If mandatory reporting was not an issue, she would tell the nurse everything about the abuse. I say no when my home visitor asks about abuse because that's how you play the game. People are afraid of social services. It's my biggest fear. Like I was saying about my friend, the reason she doesn't disclose, the reason she don't disclose is because she thinks the nurse is going to call children's services. She avoids the nurse a lot. And this is from home visitation, but we can see this in at Nationwide Children's where our organization is part of. We can see this in all different settings that interact with, with parents who may be experiencing domestic violence. So, there's too many of us to do like a little true and false poll probably, but just think for yourself, do we think my goal should be for the client to disclose the abuse they're experiencing? Really, the answer is no here. We need to move away from focusing on the disclosure. I know like our home visitors have these, you know, these screening questions that they have to ask things like, do you feel safe at home and asking about the relationship, but we cannot take it personally if somebody does not share the abuse that they're experiencing because it may be them protecting themselves. It may be a protective strategy that they're using because they're afraid of what might happen. Um, instead, survivors tell us they want us to be non judgmental, they want us to listen, they want us to offer information and support and not push for disclosure. So, really focusing back on instead of pushing for disclosure or trying to find the magical screening question that gets all the information, right? Instead, our role, all of us here on this call, is to increase the safety and support that people have access to and decrease that carefully constructed isolation that's been built up around that survivor and her children. We can do this by thinking of this as a partnership, which I think 
home visitors and caseworkers and community health workers all do a great job of approaching clients, patients, or people that they serve with this mutual collaborative approach. And that is key to instilling this sense of like empowerment back in that survivor. We all wanna do this through building a support network. So getting to know your local resources, like I'll share a little bit about the center here and then offering empowered decision-making. Very simply, my director always says, we wanna offer more coulds than shoulds because no one likes to be should on. Okay, I said that right. So consider that offering options, getting armed kind of with your, your knowledge of different support services that can off, be offered as options. I'm gonna move through this really quickly, but this is an alternative approach to screening. Instead, we focus more on confidentiality, universal education and empowerment, rather than pushing for a disclosure. So in this way we can offer, hey, I've started sharing some resources with all of my clients. Um, just, just wanted to share some information about what healthy relationships can look like. There's some information we have here if you have, or if you know someone who's in an unhealthy relationship or who needs to talk about a complicated relationship, we have some resources for you. And then we really encourage providing a warm referral or at least offering a warm referral. So if you'd like, I can put you on the phone right now with someone who knows about complicated relationships and they can help you make a plan to be safer. We're never gonna push someone to leave a relationship before they're ready. That is not the goal of advocacy. Um, and it could just really look like using their language, right? So complicated relationship or, tough, we've got some tough stuff going on. Hey, I have a client with me on the line who's got some tough stuff going on in their relationship and they asked me to help connect them to you. That can be really what that, that handoff looks like. And then I'm gonna share just really briefly about our center. Um, we are located in Columbus. We're part of Nationwide Children's Hospital. So most folks know us that way, um, but what most people don't know about us is that we have services for adults, which is maybe a little bit weird for a pediatric hospital, but we realized a long time ago that there was a lot of abuse that was uh, co-occurring, like child abuse uh, co-occurring in the same homes, the same households and families as intimate partner violence or domestic violence. And so we realized we really need to make sure we have services and supports for people who are experiencing domestic violence which may also be impacting children. And now we have really expanded this out to a robust adult services program that has domestic violence advocacy services, legal services, and um, counseling and, and treatment supports. And these are for anyone. No one has to be connected with Nationwide Children's. You don't have to have a child. Um, any person can reach out and be connected to our services. Our advocacy services are free and they can include things like safety planning, wherever someone is in the relationship or the, the process, right? We're not gonna say you have to leave, um, you know, before we'll help you, you have to get out of the relationship, like not at all. We wanna be able to support people where they are and help them be safer wherever they are. Um, this can also look like getting linkages to community resources, um, doing some education, people help people feel like they're not so alone. Um, what you're going through is, you know, uh, it makes sense and what you're saying, we believe you and others have experienced, there, there's some language around what you've experienced. Um, providing other kinds of additional support like court accompaniment, um, being able to meet folks out in the community and get able to support them with resources, housing connections, things like that. We also have attorneys and paralegals on staff who are able to help um, support with some of the very complicated legal situations that can arise. Even things like, you know, um, intimate partner violence survivors are more likely to be evicted um, or have threats of eviction because of the nature of the abuse, punching holes in the wall, having the police called out, noise complaints. So things that our attorneys can do is help collaborate with those landlords, right? And say, you know, this could be potentially a gender discrimination thing. Um, we need you to reconsider this eviction. Um, getting that support of having like an attorney behind that can be really helpful. 
That's just one example. And then of course that counseling and support services. Something I will say just to you all is when people think about domestic violence services, like if I'm in, in that situation and I'm thinking, what might be out there for me? I think what most people hear is their shelter or calling the police or getting therapy. And those are all part of a response that, that could be the right thing for a survivor, for other survivors, not the right things. But the missing piece that people don't really know what to ask for is called advocacy. And if that, the way we talk about that is like I said earlier, hey, these people know about complicated relationships and they can help you think through some ways to keep you safer or to make life a little bit easier. Um, do you wanna talk through that with someone? So there's a lot of different ways to talk about it, but I like to keep it pretty um, fluid. And then just some ideas about what safer planning can look like, because we're not going to rescue anyone, right? We're not going to swoop someone up and, you know, put them in our guest room, which sometimes I think about it. Like I could put up a survivor here in this room, but I do not have to be the superhero, right? And if I'm trying to rescue, then that puts that survivor in a position of having one more person trying to tell them what to do and be in charge of them. And instead we want that mutual collaborative empowerment. So things to think about to help people be safer, always in everything you do, whatever role you have, be keeping that relationship in mind. Consider the dynamics that you've witnessed, consider the power dynamics that you've observed and that you're concerned about keeping that in mind with all your goal setting and, and visitations that you do. Checking in with them what, about partner's potential reaction. So going, hey, like we wanna try this, we wanna try switching to formula, that's your goal, right? Um, would it be, what do you think your partner is gonna say about that? Do you anticipate any issues? How can we help brainstorm around that potential backlash? Um, listen and problem solve with the survivor about how to meet their need, knowing and keeping in mind their priorities and potential risks that exist. Think, asking yourself, how have they coped in the past? What's been helpful? Um, who and what do they have that's supportive around them? Looking for those strengths and protective factors. That's also going to help you be able to kind of set aside that superhero cape and remember, ooh, they're capable. They have other supports and resources. It's not just me. And then supporting the survivor supports the child. Sometimes, and this is very, very hard for us to get our heads around when we care and we're worried about someone, but sometimes staying in the relationship can be a protective strategy. And that is very hard to be in that situation with someone that you care about and you just want them to be away from that abusive person, but really considering we do not know the ins and outs of their situation better than they do. And for some people, like parents have said to us, um, our clients will say, yeah, when I was with the child's father, I was able to have all these strategies to help keep them safe while the abuse was occurring or to mitigate the abuse. I could had all these informal strategies to keep the child safe. But once I left the relationship, went through the custody case, the custody battle, dad got unsupervised visitation rights, and now I don't have any control over keeping that child safe when they're with their parent. Um, all of my good strategies are gone out the window because I don't have that person, um, I don't have that presence anymore. So please, before we accuse someone of like, if you really care about your child, you just leave, please consider that every survivor who's a parent that I've talked to, their top 20 priorities are their child's safety and their child's well-being. Their safety might be like number 20 out of, you know, one through 20. So please consider that they have thought through the angles of this much longer than you have. And we want to build up their supports that they have around them with more formal supports, linkages to advocacy and other services um, that are boosting up the good protective things that they're already doing. So that respectful partnering is key. And you yourself, I'm gonna go back to the side and then I'm wrapping up with that, I promise. Um, you yourself as that um, home visitor that, you know, if we have like pediatricians on the, on the line, OBGYNs, like whoever, whatever your role is, 
you yourself can call our intake, call ODVN, um, get these resources online to really talk through, how do I support this patient? I'm really struggling with this client situation. What should I be thinking about? I need to offload this to someone. Use our resources for that as well. So with that, I will close out. Thank you so much for the time. And let me know if you have questions. Perfect. So if there are any additional questions, please drop them in the chat. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, we do have two questions and they can be to either you or Emily. Um, it seemed like they came right kind of in the middle. Um, so please be kind about me mispronouncing your name if I do. So I apologize about that. Um, so Laronica um, asked if a domestic violence victim has an address with Franklin County, but they have fled to Delaware County for safety purposes. Are there any agencies that will work with the family because Delaware County will not work with that family? I can speak to the Center for Family Safety and Healing. We absolutely can support that survivor. Um, we don't have any like jurisdictional boundaries or location boundaries. It's all about if we can be convenient to the survivor. A lot of our advocacy can take place virtually or out in the community. And in fact, we have a Westerville office, so we do service a lot of Delaware County folks. Um, so we're absolutely here as a resource for anyone in any county. At least give us a call. The other thing I would just say to um, speak more specifically across the state, there should not be, there is no um, federal requirements or anything around like serving in county versus out of county so no domestic violence agency should be turning people away for out of county um and so that would also go for like relocation purposes if you have somebody that's in franklin county but needs to relocate outside of franklin county um so just just to make a plug for that beautiful thank you so much um, and then we just have one more question. It looks like it came from Callie. Um, she stated reroute family engagement works with families and youth under 13 dealing with trauma and violence. And she is looking at partnering with you guys. Um, so would you um, be the right person for her to reach out to? Or is there a better contact for her to make that partnership? Callie, I'm pretty sure we are in the CRC together. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you work with Columbus Public Health, right? So I think you and I could connect um, next at the next like CRC session that we see each other. Because we absolutely are open to partnering. We love to come out and do education, bring resources, and establish some, you know, um, open communication with, you know, everyone and anyone that we can. So please reach out. Okay, so perfect. So um, Brian will close us out. Brian um, Malakowski, he is the administrator and counsel for the Safe at Home program through the Ohio Secretary of State. So he will actually be sharing some amazing services and resources which can help survivors across Ohio, not just Franklin County. Um, so thank you so much, Brian. I'm looking forward to it. Take us away. Thanks, Agata, and for everyone who's on today, um, I'm Brian, um, and I generally oversee the Save at Home program. I'm going to apologize real fast because it's going to be a lot of information coming at you very quickly, um, but it will help um, all of your clients and probably other people that you meet um, as you go about your day. Here's where we're going. So everyone on, on the call should have a surface understanding of Save at Home. There's a lot of people who work for state and local government, and they should really know there are different responsibilities that they have for any public records. And um, anyone who's a direct uh, service provider should know like, how this is applicable, maybe for their clients, and it's a different way to help their clients and their clients' families stay safe. Um, so part of um, tagging off of what Julie just said before about sometimes staying can be a safer choice, it's up to them. We come along afterwards, um, after they've decided that their uh, their old home is no longer safe, then safe at home is really their, their next step to staying safe. So what is safe at home? It's a set of laws that provide um, address confidentiality protections for victims of domestic violence 
men seen by stalking, human trafficking, rape, and sexual battery. We often shorthand it to just sexual or domestic violence, um, but it's a little more nuanced than that. Um, it's part of Ohio law, so it's not just an office initiative. It has the force of law, and we'll get into the consequences later on if people violate that. Also, it's a statewide law, so it's not just Franklin County. If, if you are in the program and you're driving along 71 and you're pulled over in Mansfield, but you live in Columbus, it will still protect you there. Um, and it was just expanded last year. So what are we talking about? Everyone on this call probably knows the most dangerous time for victims is when they leave. Um, so there's been the, an explosion of a niche industry of, that crawls public records to find people. Um, so Safe at Home is really the state of Ohio's um, stance that we're going to treat these especially vulnerable victims differently. We're going to change public records law to hide them. Um, we also work with different states because sometimes people are hunted from state to state and we work together to hide them. Um, I often think it's helpful to think of it as a distant cousin of a witness protection program. We're not in law enforcement. Um, we are we're different, but we make sure that people who are in the program can stay hidden. Um, so we'll go into the different aspects of it. So the most powerful part of the program is we convert your address to be confidential under Ohio law. So any state or local entity that you engage with will have to change your true address, let's say 123 Main Street, to a different address. Um, they're used from uh, courts to schools to law enforcement. There are very, very few exceptions. Um, boards of elections are one. I'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, so um, after uh, you're in the program, your name, address, phone number, um, that is all going to be excluded under any public records. Uh, when you're in the program, your driver's license or state ID card will be replaced as long as you want to um, with our physical address here. So um, as you go about your day, there's lots of times you have to provide your ID. You won't show the other person who, where you truly live. And if you lose your wallet, you don't need to worry about being found. We have wallets returned to our actual address here. We are also a mail repackaging facility. So uh, participants get a, a P.O. box in Columbus. Um, there's one P.O. box for everyone in the state. Their mail comes here, then we repackage it. We know their true address and we send it to wherever they want, be it their actual address or their own P.O. box, wherever they feel safe having our mail sent to them. Um, we're also their agent for receiving service of process. And just as a heads up, because mail has to bounce through Columbus, it will take a little longer. Um, so I think there are some people from Delaware. I don't know how many people um, might be on from further away, but just know that it'll take a little longer to get to um, your clients. Um, so everyone who's in Save at Home is part of PO Box 910. Each individual household will have their own lot number. So if you see this address ever as you're going about your day at work or um, after work, just please be gracious with them. They've been through trauma. Um, we also have safe names that are signed by our office. Um, they might ask you to mail something under their safe name. Um, that's It's up to you if um, I'm speaking really towards people who are in um, government. It's up to you if your uh, office allows that. Um, it's not okay to decline to use the PO box if they ask you to do that. Um, but ask us if you have any questions about that. Um, a person who is otherwise eligible to vote, um, they can convert their, pub, their voter record into a confidential one, um, but it's very important that they first get into the program and then register to vote. When they come into the program, we'll, there's a special voter registration form that we'll send them. If they register to vote first in a normal voter registration form, those are public facing. And there are lots of entities that um, are trying to drive out the vote, different political parties. Um, there's right now two statewide issues. And lots of people are trying to get all those people and all the public voter lists to vote their way. It's public facing. 
get into Safe at Home first, then register to vote, and nobody from the outside will have access to your information. And last, there is a new um, real property confidentiality procedure. It's pretty complicated. Um, I, I encourage you to give us a call um, to work through everything. This is another thing that first you have to get into the program and then acquire the, the property. Um, so compliance. Um, our bad guy isn't the abuser. Our bad guy is the governmental actor who disclosed a participant's information. Um, so it can be a judge, it can be law enforcement, it, it can be, um, I, I won't pick on anyone else in particular, but it happens. Um, so uh, when that does happen, we will get involved. Um, not all states, if you have somebody who's coming into your program who um, is coming from a different state, our state is a little different. Um, so what they tell you might be a little outdated from their, their prior um, state. Uh, just be, be cautious as they're telling you different things about it. Again, always come to us with questions. Um, federal government isn't really bound by our state law. Uh, they, they work with us and they're great partners, but we're not bound, we're not binding them to our things. And anyone on here, um, Please inform your clients that if they're having trouble with government, that we can help. Um, so people who are on from government, um, it's it's a crime if you disclose their information. So I won't go into all of this, but don't disclose what they have. If you do, we quickly get involved. And I don't want to talk about prosecutions because we're not going to go down that road because we're going to avoid compliance issues. Um, so we work. Um, with lots of county officials throughout the state. I'm happy to meet with everyone around Central Ohio. Um, I want to help you be successful in keeping the participants safe. Um, also, if you are um, if you work for the county government, your prosecutor's office, uh, don't forget that they are your lawyer and you should be working with them. Um, if you have questions, I can't provide you legal advice. I can talk about general things. And your calls with me are not privileged. So just make sure you're not going to tell me something that you don't want me to know. Um, so as you're going about this, um, you don't know who's in the program. We have participant authorization cards and anyone who works for um, whatever governmental entity the participant wants to hide their address from, they have to show their card. Um, in a worst case scenario, um, the very top levels of law enforcement. So the chief, the sheriff, um, they have access to who is in the program through Oleg. This is what the card knows, what the card looks like. That's the front for Betty Buckeye, and that's the back. Um, Caseworkers make sure that if you have a participant, they carry their card on them because you never know when you're going to face someone from law enforcement or um, different courts. It just always keep their card on them. Hey, Brian. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, we, um, we can't see your slides. So when you are showing us a card, we're not able to see it. Sorry. Oh, no. Sorry to interrupt. No, I'm, Sorry. I'm glad. We sent you a chat. I didn't want to interrupt you. Oh, no. Can you see now? Thank you yes. for interrupting me. Yes. I will go back to the slides. Thanks. Uh, so this is what the card looks like. Um, that's the front for Betty Buckeye. And that is the back. Um, Julie, really, thank you. Um, so who can apply for safe at home? Um, it's an adult person. Um, if they're under fear for um, themselves or somebody who lives with them, and the other person is a victim of DV, menacing by stalking, the other crimes that I mentioned before, there's an exception for sex offenders. Um, so a person who um, is under a public registry, um, they, they, it doesn't make sense for them. Um, the applicant themselves doesn't have to be the victim. We have um, lots of moms, the, the child is a victim. Um, 
So, uh, or if they are uh, a guardian, that's fine too. Um, just have to have the applicant fear for their safety or the safety of someone else. Um, we don't have any requirements for um, filing a police report or any type of evidence. That's especially handy when we're working with people who have to go between different states. Um, when do they apply? Um, it's usually immediately before or after they move to a new location. Um, we want disinformation here, so a bad address out there that looks like it's good um, will help the person stay safe. Um, in the past, the law required them to move before joining, um, but uh, the laws changed, and, and there's some um, aspect of fairness if a person got to a new home and then they learned about safe at home, then they, they would have to be forced to uproot again. If they're safe and um, they want to join the program, then um, they should be able to. But if their attacker already knows where they live, the program will not be effective. So how do you get into the program? Uh, you go through an application assistant. You don't go directly to us. We partner with agencies and nonprofits throughout the state who can do the safety planning and who know the resources that are available in your community. Um, it's an easy process. It's not like a civil protection order. You don't have to go to court. It's really easy to wrap this up in half an hour. Think of it kind of like a wraparound service. Um, so to find an application assistant, um, our website has them or, um, organized in alphabetical order by county. Um, once you're in the program, you're in for four years, but you can renew it. Um, we let people know um, ahead of time so that they can file everything to make sure that they stay in. So please inform your clients. Um, you should have some type of um, screening process. Um, if anyone's on from JFS, um, unfortunately, you cannot become an application assistant. Sometimes um, people ask me afterwards, so it's easier to um, just let everyone know up front, but you can tell them about the program and you can help them find an application assistant that would be um, safe for them to feel vulnerable and talk with. Um, so child custody and support proceedings. This is a terribly ugly slide and I won't go through everything, but just know there's a new process for people who are in the program to stay safe as they're doing, uh, as they're going through a child custody or um, a battle in court. It's not for other types of litigation, so personal injury or even a, a divorce that doesn't involve kids. Um, the, the process is pretty um, intuitive. The person who's requesting the disclosure, um, they have the uphill fight. They have to prove by clear and convincing evidence that the disclosure is necessary and it does not pose a risk of harm to the participant or the kid. And then the court has to document its findings. Um, I'm not aware of this ever prevailing across the entire state. Um, if you do need um, the participants to um, to disclose where they live, there's a way to do it. Um, so this shouldn't happen as we were talking about, but sometimes um, for public assistance, they need to prove that they live in a particular county. So there's a way for us to go about that. Um, it's this form and it's pretty simple. Um, the participant will send it to us and then we will act on their behalf and we make sure that whoever we are giving the information to um, knows that if they redisclose this, they're committing a crime and there will be consequences for that. And I am terribly sorry that half of my PowerPoint you couldn't see, but um, if you have any questions about Save at Home, I would love to take them now. If you want to talk about anything offline, I'm happy to do that too. Um, if you um, are interested in partnering with us um, to have someone in your office become an application assistant, I'd love to talk about that as well. So with that, um, Agata, I'll hand it back to you if there's any questions. Perfect. So there are a couple questions. Um, I actually have a question. Um, and so I know you talked about um, if you're a survivor, you want to join the program before registering to vote. And so I just wanted to know what happens if you're a survivor and you're already registered to vote in your home and then you move, you join the program and you move to a safe location. Um, 
is there a way to hide the new address or if they're already registered to vote, it's kind of already too late? So you're asking two different things. Um, when So going back into my election law um, hat, um, when you're moving, you have to update your address with your board of elections. Mm -hmm. So if you want to, you have to make sure that they're um, up to date because let's say you used to live in Westerville and now you live in Columbus. Um, well, one, you should be voting on um, the Columbus mayor's race. Um, right. So they should know that. Um, if you are already registered to vote and then you join safe at home, um, you can hide your address. Um, you don't need to worry about the deadlines for voter registration stuff. Um, but I encourage everyone, if you're eligible to get into safe at home and you want to get into the program as fast as possible, because you never know when you need to hide your address, you should start immediately. Um, but um, you you need to update your board of elections for voting purposes. It, it, it's a little different. Gotcha. Okay. Um, thank you. And then Jonathan asked a question, and I'm not sure if this would go to Ryan or Julie or Ann both. Um, but he stated, is the Center for Family Safety and Healing a referral body for the Safe at Home program? They are, and they're amazing. And ODBN helps with our training. So you have amazing people here, and I love their organizations. Perfect. Um, Victoria just asked, how long is the approval process? That is up to um, the part will be participants. So it has to be notarized. And that notarization is really helpful when we have um, sometimes people trying to scam us. Like, oh, I want to cancel out of the program. That has to be notarized too. So there's a check. It can be we process them same day that they come in and get out. Um, so it, it's a little lag for the mail, but everyone here is pretty local. So the mail shouldn't take that lot that long to get in. Um, but the participants, um, they're in charge of it. Um, if you have someone in your office who can notarize it, then you can wrap it up really fast, but it's pretty fast. Awesome. Okay. Um, and then it looks like we just have one general question. Um, Caroline stated, please direct those of us that work in an office setting regarding pregnant minors reporting abuse. Besides reporting to CPS, is there anything else that they could do to help the survivor? Um, that's asking a few questions. So one, um, they, they can be in the program as far as reporting, um, that gets a little messier and I, that one, I'd, I'd like to talk to the person offline because I, I don't think we have time for that, that whole discussion, but law enforcement can know the person's address, but there's a lot of safeguards on that. Okay. Um, but that's a great question. Thank you for that. Yeah. I think also just to uh, one resource for people to around when we are dealing with um, youth involved in any sort of potential abuse that's going on would be like, you know, depending on the situation, obviously, you know, sometimes it requires a report that be made, but there's also for just if we're referring um, family members on like what to do if they have a child that is going through abuse. Uh, the any sort of agency or any sort of state or I'm sorry, county um, child advocacy agency would be able to help. So, like, obviously, you would reach out to Julie um, here in Franklin County, but that's always like if you're just not sure where to start, starting with your local program can be a good resource to try to figure out where to navigate that because it is a very complex issue. Thank you, Emily. And, and I would just add, if you're thinking about intimate partner violence and a pregnant teen, even though they're a minor, still making sure that we're talking to them about the process, about if you are in a mandatory reporting situation, to think, to really get support from like supervision, make sure that you've really thought through kind of the process of, of what could happen and then talking with that survivor saying, you know, what are you at? What concerns do you have? You know that I'm a mandatory reporter. There are things that you've shared that are concerning to me. Do you have any like concerns if, you know, when I do have to make this report, like what um, do you want to talk through? Like what that could look like? And they might say, oh, yeah, he said that if I told anyone and 
police show up at my door, then X, Y, Z threat is going to happen. So we want to gain that information and it, you, we need informed consent um, to be able to get that really vital information. So I've talked with some like sane nurses who were just so wonderful and lovely, but they were like, shouldn't we try not to tell people that we're mandatory reporters and so that we can get all the information out of them that we can and we can help them? And I see you, Emily, like, no, because if we really think about what we're trying to do here, which is empower that survivor and know that they have the most information about their situation, like they could sit down with us for two whole days and tell us every in and out of everything that's been going on. And there's still going to be missing pieces that we don't have. So really honoring the agency of that individual, even if they're a minor, then also giving that informed consent and finding out what are their concerns about the reporting process. It doesn't mean that you don't follow through on your mandatory reporting obligations, but you're partnering with them. And often we find a lot of success in saying, do you want to make this call together? And if they're comfortable with that, then they can share the specific details of, oh yeah, my ex said, if I tell anyone about who the baby's father is or whatever, then I'm going to be in trouble. So we need to get that information and share it. So get consultation on that, on those tough situations too. Like Emily said, call the Center for Family Safety and Healing or your local program. Ah, Levex reminded me that I'm muted. So uh, thank you so much for that. And actually one more question came up while we were chatting um, and it does seem to go to Brian. Um, so Jonathan asked, does Safe at Home offer any protection if another state or state's court does not honor our state, our state Safe at Home program? I have talked with courts from different states and um, it, might, uh, classic answer is it depends. Um, the person is still better off being in the program if, if they're concerned. And we do work with people um, in different states. Um, my counterparts and I um, regularly discuss different things um, as we have um, issues to resolve between the different states. So, um, I guess my only answer is maybe it, it really depends on, on what's going on. And most judges, like everyone wants to keep a victim safe. Um, so we can usually find a way to, um, to get through this as long as um, sometimes there are issues of fraud and sometimes people do try to join these programs as a way to avoid prosecution or to commit fraud. And then that gets a little, that's a different situation. Um, so if you have a question, um, give me a call. Just don't give me the name. Perfect. Well, that seems to be, um, all of the questions. We've gotten a lot of great feedback. Thank you so much, Brian, Emily, and Julie for taking the time today, um, for coming and sharing. Um, I will email out the slides. It seemed everybody loved your guys' slides. So I would love to share those. Um, I will share our social media on here and please take our survey when you um, exit out. I really want to thank everybody for coming and you will get about 10 minutes back of your time. So thank you so much.